Okay. All righty, so we have our th three member quorum so we can get started. Uh, first item is the approval of the October 14th agenda. Move to approve. Motion approve. Christy, you go with that? I'm good with that. I second okay, that motion. So, all righty, so it's, that's approved. And the uh, meeting minutes, did everybody get a chance to take a look at it? I know they came in a little late. I looked at them, they looked okay, but let's see what Larry- to approve is. minutes. All righty. I can, I can second that if you didn't get a chance to look at it, Christy, because they look fine to me, but- They look fine, move to approve. Yeah, I reviewed them before. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, in favor, well, aye. Apologies for that, we'll, we'll try and get them out sooner. Yeah, well, you were busy with the freedom ticket thing yesterday, so that's understandable. All righty, so next thing would be, yeah, it would be the board chair's report. All righty, um, not a lot, really not a lot going on this, this month. Um, with the Port Authority putting LaGuardia's air train under reevaluation, I will be renewing my request to make the Willits Point station fully accessible as soon as possible. I don't know realistically how quick they can do it because I don't think they have any money in the budget now for it because they thought the Port Authority was going to pick it up. But uh, I'll bring it up at the committee meeting on Monday and maybe we can look under the seat cushions and find something to get this thing rolling. Um, also at next Monday's uh, committee meeting, I'll we'll again raise the issue of a 20 trip peak ticket with a 20% discount to reflect uh, one of our new com commutation patterns. Uh, new Jersey Transit has already implemented this. Um, they call it a flex ticket, but it's exactly what I'm talking about. 20 trips for 20% off a peak fare. And what I'm hoping is that we can have this ticket option in place by January 1st, at least as a pilot program and maybe made permanent later on during the year. Um, have started to receive some complaints about some rush hour trains being overcrowded. So I'll ask Hector to address this issue uh, later in the meeting. Uh, let's see what else we got. A little bit more here. I received a complaint from a parent of a student at St. Anthony's High School in Huntington regarding an afternoon train to Port Jefferson that was rescheduled, causing her child to be forced to wait an extra half, an extra hour after school or forcing her to drive to Huntington to pick him up. Uh, she claimed that this was a hardship for a couple of dozen students, but Hector uh, Garcia did investigate the situation, spoke to the school principal uh, and found out that, that was a bit of an exaggeration. The, Apparently, she was the only parent that was really complaining about it. They had a couple other people mention it, but uh, the school adjusted their buses to meet the newly scheduled train, uh, and they said that they had things for the kids to do while they were waiting. So, I, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's a non-issue. I'm not going to push it any further, uh, and I thank Hector for his diligence in the matter. I also received some information from the Long Island Railroad's safety department regarding the railroad's tracks school safety program for the 2021-22 20, school year. Uh, I will be presenting this information to the Suffolk Region PTA at their October board meeting uh, next Monday. And I'll also send a copy of this program to the Nassau Region PTA director as well. And unfortunately, this is rather timely in that we had a student struck and killed in Bayport less than a month ago. So. It's, it's a good program. They've had it for a number of years and it's set up this year that it can be done completely remote. It's not like they have to go into the schools or anything. So again, I'll get the word around at the meeting on Monday night and we'll see what we can do. And that's it on my end. Is, is Hector here yet? Yes. Okay. So Hector, we'll just turn it right over to you. I prefer what, like I like the question and answer format as opposed to I don't want to do a speech or anything. <laughs> well, okay. Well, we had a couple of things listed on the agenda. I'd say I assume Lisa might have given you the heads up we were kind of looking for. Um, Hello? Yeah, Lisa. 
Is that you? No, Ron. Ron, your um, Ron, your your um name is lighting up. So. Yeah, Ron, can you go on mute, please? I'm gonna mute you, Ron. Muted. All right, okay, so let me, Hector, well, I'm gonna start. I'll start with the overall question. What's our ridership numbers up to now? How about we start with that? So still around. We we get over the last month. We've gone to about fifty percent of the pre-pandemic levels. Okay, that's great. It. That's it. No, yeah. that's that's up from forty percent about a month ago, right? Or forty-two yes. percent a month ago? Yeah, over the past month, it's gone up to about fifty percent. Is that weekday and weekend, or is that are there still more that's, higher that's ridership week, on? That's weekday. Uh, for the let me see, I have something here. Yeah, that's weekday. Uh, we and then we we just had we just got the numbers from the summer, and I believe overall for the summer service, it was up to seventy percent of normal. Uh, for the summer service and also the other another positive trend was for the the mets games uh or mets willis points so mets and, and the u.s open uh i think it was like 156 was the ridership for for that station for the whole season uh but september was about i think 60,000 just just for september uh so that we ended up very strongly with that and then for um the, the, the Forest Hills Stadium there, they opened up in July. So we had about 10,000 customers uh, going there. Uh, so that's kind of showing that this discretionary travel, it's, it's has rebounded very well uh, ahead of the commuters. Well, I think with the weekly commuters, it's what their offices are allowing. So, I mean, obviously if you can work from home three days a week, you can work from home three days a week. So you're only gonna come in when they mandate that you come in, so. Um, and there are some businesses that might not, they're seriously considering leaving people to do a hybrid uh, schedule. And some of the ones that want to bring their people back full time are looking like January. So it's, it's uh, I guess, uh, I guess those numbers are probably about as well as we could expect at this time. Um, how do they compare to the McKinsey report? I know that they were saying that we'd get so many people back at a certain period of time. I think we're a little bit ahead of that curve, right? Yes, yeah, so we're a little bit ahead of that. Uh, so that's that's positive also. All righty. Um, the other thing on the agenda so was I, the mask and mask enforcement update. Uh, I does appear that they are getting a little more serious about it. Um, they seem to be writing more violations or issuing more tickets. But I was wondering if you had any further information on that. Uh, nothing behind what's been announced, but the, you know, yeah, the, the MTPD announced a, uh, you know, cracking down and being more out there. So, and then as, as when I get a complaint, we report it and then they immediately, you know, the next day they ride that train. Uh, so that's how they're responding to, to complaints. Great. One, one more thing with ridership is, you know, so we, we are monitoring closely, you know, we have been getting more complaints about crowded trains, but it's, we still don't see trains that say like over 80% for the most part, uh, but we're looking to, you know, some, once something becomes over 85% or so, then we will look to see if we can add either. I, I think we did add some cars recently. Uh, if, if we can do that, we'll do that. And if, and if if we have to add a train to, to release some congestion, we will, but it has to really be like standing room only, not just because it's a little crowded. Yeah. I, um, I put something out there on social media to try and get some feedback. And one of the one of the things that was very interesting is uh, people like to sit in a certain spot, I guess by the by where the stairs, where the trains land, and something like that. And I know there was one lady that said, "I was in one car and it was extremely crowded, and I walked up. It was a twelve car train, and I walked up three or four cars, and there were plenty of seats." So it's a possibility that you get the people that are just, they got to sit where they got to sit. And, you know, I don't know what we could do about that. The other thing I noticed, I was, um, I was, my train's usually pretty good in the morning, the 539 out of Patchogue, but I had to come in early this morning. So I was on the 541 out of Babylon, which is generally a pretty crowded train. And what I noticed was, and with the environment being what it is, I could see it. You know, nobody wanted to sit next to anybody, you know, so they're considering a crowded train if there's not a seat that's not immediately next to anybody. So in other words, a three-seater, you'd have one at the window, one at the aisle, nobody in the middle. 
And at most of the two seaters, you would just have one person in there. And I noticed quite a few people opted to just stand rather than, you know, sit next to somebody. So that's, I don't know how you, how you deal with that. Um, I did notice one of the things, at least on my branch, on a Montauk branch, that it looks like you've added cars to some of the trains to kind of stretch out. Um, I get the 430 out of Hunter's Point. Back in the old days, that was a three, if we were lucky, a four car train. Now, most days it's a five and some days it's a six. And that, that's not on Fridays, that's every day. So it, I think the people at the railroad are keeping an eye on this and trying to move some things around. And since we have a few less diesel trains available, uh, you know, I guess you have the cars that you can take and, and add on to other trains. Yeah, because we're, we're not running a hundred percent service. So we do have some extra equipment that we can do that, but we're trying to, you know, hold it as needed. We don't want to like use them all up and all of a sudden then we have a real problem and then can't react. Um, the next thing we had was the uh, Penn, Penn Station update. How are we doing the Penn? No, we're still, uh, still proceeding, still on track. So I think it's like either, not the end of next year, but early the following year is when they're supposed to complete that work. So we're, we're looking at early first quarter of 2023? Yes. Because it's hard to tell right now because all you, all you just see are plywood partitions. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, and you really can't tell what's going on beyond that. And of course, this you got the ceilings in above too. So, so actually, I, I didn't after I went with you guys, but then afterwards, I, I was there last month uh, for another tour um, behind the scenes there. So, along Seventh Avenue, uh, along there, you know where Kmart used to be. Yeah. Uh, kind of what's happening is all the way out to the street, there was utilities there. So that that's all being relocated to go all the way north uh, under the sidewalk so that then there'll be the space to expand. So that's what's happening. I think they got most of the utilities moved now and now that now they're going to start building it out. Okay. Um, uh, but it says it's going to take that long, right? It's going to take 2023. I mean, it's, it's a huge project. Don't get me wrong, but just already. How about third track? Are we, how are we looking at third track? We, we have a question. Oh, we have a question. Okay. Do have a question. Um, I did see that the kiosk is up and running and it's, it, that it's expanded um, over by the, um, by track 21 tracks. Yeah, by 7th Avenue, which was great to see. And then I almost went and bought things just to make sure that it stays in business. Um, <laughs> so Ron has asked, when food is back, what sort of food vendors are you, uh, is, are being planned for? So I believe the deal is going to be, Vornado is going to be, be the one to kind of, Put the vendors back there but i think they're trying to do i don't know they're, they're the ones that are going to be in charge of that that's part of the deal are you able to uh, ask for sort of a mix of um what was there and what they're going to make more money on that's a good day florio question <laughs> no, I, I think the concern for most of the commuters is you know we want a mixed bag uh you know, it, it's it's okay if you have you know high class Starbucks, but you know some people just want Dunkin' Donuts. Um, you could have it's a fancy, bread. you know, you can have a sushi restaurant. You know, you can have a sushi restaurant that that's that's fine. You know, for the upper crust, but uh, a lot of people want you know Rose's Pizza and you know River Rose's Pizza and a Coke or a Rose's Pizza and a beer or something like that. So the concern. That I'm getting from most of the commuters, we don't want it all high class. You know, we don't want it all low class either. But you know, we really would like to see a mixed bag, and we're hoping that's what Renato will do. Well, I think the term is also grab and go. Some place where you can get a quick slice of pizza and you're out. Um, Some place where you can even get a quick burger, even if it is McDonald's, and get out or fries or something like that. Um, people are not going to sit down at restaurants. They're coming in. They're growing for a train. They want something quick in and out. Or in my case, a pretzel. <laughs> then again, we want those places that when we're when our train is delayed, we have somewhere to sit down and get a bite to eat and relax and not have to worry about finding a seat. So we have to be mindful of that as well. So that, that's also a good point out because I know that oftentimes when my train was late, I used to go, you know, sit down at the bar and get some food if I had an hour or two to spare. So 
I know, and unfortunately, that's a problem. And until we get the ridership back up and get some of the more trains restored, you can get caught in a situation where you got an hour to kill, which, uh, in fact, one of the feedback I got is I got some complaints about the train that the reason we're meeting at four o'clock instead of 430 because we don't have a 627 anymore. And we have it's like an hour and 39 minute wait between trains. If you miss, if I miss the 551 tonight, my next train to Patchog is 730. You know, that's a big wait because that's still four to eight is still considered rush hour. And that, that is a big gap in a rush hour. And in fact, one of the people on social media actually suggested that that's why he drives. <laughs> he says, because I, I can't sit around in Penn Station if I miss a train by 10 minutes. I can't sit around for another hour and a half and made a pretty valid point. Um, I got to tell you, the roads are hell driving right now. Uh, yeah, they're a little, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I, I, somebody in your office, uh, Lisa, sent out a document a while ago with numbers. I have no idea what the numbers are right now for bridges and tunnels, but I got to say they are really high. I mean, the roads are jammed. I'm driving back and forth every once in a while to Jersey. Um, I, when I go into the city, I, I take the train or I have to drive when I'm working on the, on the east side. Um, and it's a lot easier to drive in, but a two and a half hour drive in is not unexpected from Long Island. It's crazy now. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 um, the board books will be up anytime um, this afternoon or tomorrow and um, Bridges and Tunnels uh, books will probably reflect that it's probably close to 100% of where it was pre-pandemic. Um, and I would imagine that you'll see that it's probably over that at, at sometimes a day. I mean, I see that from my unofficial perch. I yeah, I think, the Midtown Tunnel. I, I agree with you, Lisa. I think I think the numbers are way over 100. percent And if they say it's 50 or 60 percent, that's not right. Oh no, no. The the last uh, the last numbers that I heard was eight between 85 and 90 percent of pre-pandemic levels. You know, so then they, maybe they might be undercounting a little bit, but yeah, no, it's definitely not. They're not definitely saying oh 50 or 60. It's 85, 90 percent of pre-pandemic levels, and that's. Yeah, and let's that's our numbers. Way. So that's going through, you know, the MTA facilities. And, and you know what? And the thing is, if you're not, if you want a parking spot in a parking lot, if you're not in a parking lot by nine or nine thirty now, you're not getting in the lots. They are full. They're making a windfall on this. Yeah, that's what Alfonso. Uh, we saw Alfonso Castillo yesterday, and that's what he said. He said he was used to showing up, you know, five minutes before a train during the pandemic, and he almost missed his train from Valley Stream yesterday. Oh, I think Larry was talking about parking lots in the city. These are oh, parking lots in the for, city. For people who drive. Oh. And, and that's, oh, right, okay. The ones at the train stations are also filling up. And I, I second that, Lisa. That's that's definitely true. I actually showed up five minutes before my train and had to, <laughs> and had to take the next train because I was used to pre-pandemic. Yeah, on, on the South Shore in Belmore, where I am, there's still plenty of spots, but I'm being pushed further and further back because the lots are filling up more and more now. I've been hearing that from people on the Ronkonkoma branch as well. You know, they're, they're back to ducking airplanes now if they show up after seven o'clock. <laughs> uh, speaking of traffic, uh, before I forget, next weekend we have an outage for Queens Interlocking. As part of that, for the Elmont station, you know, the, the, the new platforms are going to go over the cross island. So we're going to have an overnight closure Saturday into Sunday next weekend uh, to put in the, the steel beams is going to support the new platforms that are going to go over the cross island. So we're starting to put out uh, messaging on that. Uh, it's it's going to be overnight. We're going to be closing the, the cross island between the southern state and northern state. Um, wow. Wow. That's I didn't big... realize the platforms ran that far. but Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go directly over the, 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 the highway on both sides. So the whole cross island, both directions, Hector, is going to be closed from northern state to southern state? Yes. It's going to be kind of wow. phased parts of it, you know, north and south, but it's going to overlap at some point. At the worst wow. part of it is going to overlap, but it's going to be like overnight. Most what day is that? Next weekend, 13th, 14th. Oh, no, no, sorry, 23rd, 24th. Not this the coming weekend, the following weekend. The following weekend, yes. All right, well, actually, that just segues right into the next thing on the agenda, the third track update. And that's all part of third track. No, so well, I actually, mean, let's, while we're, while we're on it, let's just stay on Elmont Station. Um, oh, yeah. We're at UBS Arena is pretty well getting ready to open pretty soon. 
Uh, how are we looking as far as having the station ready? So it, from the beginning, we were never going to have the full station uh, ready. Uh, so the arena is going to open on November 20th as the first game. Uh, so we're going to have the southbound platform, eight cars of the southbound platform, meaning eastbound. Right. That's going to be open for opening day. So if I haven't, I, I may not have said this before here, but so for opening day for the first year, we're going to have three options of how to get to the game by train. The first option is you take go to Jamaica and take the, they're going to have two shuttle trains from Jamaica for each game that will bring you to the okay. existing Belmont station, which is right next to the arena. Oh, yeah, that's that's a hop, skip and a jump. Yeah. Uh, if you're going eastbound, eastbound uh, Hempstead branch trains are going to be able to stop at the new Elmont station only before, during and after games. Uh, and then because of the, the westbound platform aren't ready yet. Uh, we're gonna stop mainline trains for games at Queens Village and the developer is gonna, UBS is gonna provide a shuttle bus from Queens Village to get you to the arena. So we're gonna have three options for people for the first year. Yeah, Once, that's what I was thinking. Like if, if the eastbound platform is open, but the westbound isn't, how do you get home if you're coming from the city? <laughs> it's... So, so I mean, but then actually, for, this is more for Long Islander. So, Queens Village will be either before or after games from Queens Village, you'll be able to get trains to go. You don't have, you can go to Jamaica or you can just go to Queens Village with the shuttle bus. So, you'll have that option. Uh, how about the rest of Third Track? Did, did you ever get resolved with, is it Garden City that's screwing you up? Yeah, Garden City is called Denton Avenue Bridge, which is uh, on the west end of Maryland Avenue Station. Um, it's a little tiny bridge that it's only one lane under there. Currently, cars go in both directions and they play Frogger, trying to, you know, okay. they're both trying to go in and out. You know, so they they because of the, the whole situation with the with the, the the tall poles that they don't like that they lost the lawsuit, they're refusing to issue a permit to be able for us to be able to close the road to start the work. So right now it, it is it's it's about to jeopardize uh, the timeline of the project because. Uh, you know, if we don't do that, it won't have a third track right through there. So I think we, we still have a possibility to be able to, you know, still make it, but we're waiting for a judge to issue, we, we have to sue them. So we're waiting for a judge to issue, issue a ruling. Uh, and then we're going to have to work like 24 seven in that area. So it's going to, it's actually going to be worse for their residents because now we're going to have to work 24 seven to try to make up the, the lost time to, to make the schedule. Who do you have to sue for that, Hector? Who's who owns that? It's it's the village. Village, village of Garden City. Correct. It's the village road. Well, they want to play hardball. It's you know. Yeah, related related to that in Garden City. So, what 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 the history is? So the there's a new administration there as of March or or yeah as of the spring. So they pretty much the new mayor and, and some of his new board they. They voted out everybody else that was there before that we had been cooperating with us and working with us. So any commitments we have with the village, any agreements, they're kind of just ignoring it and just being oppositional. So uh, I think uh, at the next week's board meeting, Jerry, we're gonna be announcing uh, Cherry Valley Avenue Bridge in Garden City on a Hempstead branch. It's a bridge that gets hit all the time. I just heard today, there was like, it's been hit 21 times this year. Um, this year? This year. <laughs> Oh God! Wow. So that's, so that's one that we're actually going to be we're going to go to the board to award a contract to 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 replace it. Um, the village has wanted us to replace it for a while because it's 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 it, it, it you know clogs up their downtown. But again, with this new administration there, they they may give us a hard. They're going to try to give us a hard. Luckily, it's a county road, but they're still going to try to give us a hard time about it. But that's incredible. Twenty one times. Yeah. And you have to have it. So every time it gets hit, you have to have a structural inspector come out and take a look at it. And yes, because I know we've had that at where we've had bridge getting getting hit out by me, and trains are delayed because they have to have an inspector look at it before they can go full speed over it. And, so wow. we've done a few things to mitigate that because you know I know in the past you know it would take us you know sometimes it takes a long time to get somebody to to get out there. So in some bridges we put some the, the ones that we we know the number of low bridges that we have. So we've put sensors and cameras so that uh, remotely you can kind of see how hard the hit was. And then visually you can, they can zoom in with the camera to see if anything shifted. And then at least trains can, can, can proceed slowly until a, a, an inspector goes there to go full speed. But at least we don't, we, you know. At least you can get, least you can get over them, you know. You're not correct, exactly. So we're able to right. kind of get people moving quicker a little bit. Uh, 
but we are trying to replace all the bridges that are that are low that still remain. God bless modern technology. All right. Um, all right. I guess the next question we hadn't heard much lately about the the experiment or the uh, pilot program with the dual mode DM seven battery electrics. Do we gonna try it on the Oyster Bay branch? Yeah. So the they haven't issued the report yet, but the the draft so far the the simulations they've done it shows that it will it works. Um, so we're 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 working with them now to try to, the next phase of it is to go into like give them two cars so they can retrofit them and start actually testing it. Uh, right, so we're, right. we're in negotiations with them for the, for the next phase to enter an agreement with them to, to do that. Uh, so that means next year they'll be, you know, retrofitting it. Um, and then they got to figure out how to, um, at Oyster Bay, we, we will need some type of a substation and a charging station there. Um, right. so we have to figure out what, you know, what, what that's going to look like and what it's going to cost. And, uh, but hopefully, you know, within a year or two, it'll be tested, it'll work. So, so the simulations show that between a fully charged train with batteries from Oyster Bay will make it all the way to Mineola and then it'll work on electricity after that. Um, Hector, what kind of charging uh, infrastructure will it need? Uh, so at, at the yard Oyster Bay, it'll need some type of a charging station and a substation to kind of produce the power for that. So is that like is that like electric or is that um yes okay it's so like in, in i know that there's um at i know that there have been some proposals um for uh some of the railroad stations um do nicerta do some of the grant proposals as you know they're not anywhere close to oyster bay but maybe through the next phase of some of the nicerta um grant work that they're doing they could look at um incorporating uh, charging infrastructure for the BMOOs and for other types of vehicles? Um, or is it, is it compatible? That I don't know. I have no idea if it's compatible or not. So actually one of the things I guess to clarify too is, so once we give them these two cars, they're gonna, we're gonna give them some old cars. They're gonna have to kind of get up and running. So the, the real question is how can they fit? So the batteries are, are heavy. So they have to figure out, they're gonna to have to take some components out of, out of the existing cars to fit these batteries and to decrease okay. the weight. So the thing is, you know, how many are we gonna lose them? You know, so there might be some seats lost and then they might have to take out some other things and then figure out how to, how to still make those other systems work. So that's, that's, that's the things that they have to figure out in, in the next year or so. And then once, it, once it's done, if it's proven and we know exactly what the charging is, then going into the next, capital program that we could decide, okay, you know, this is what it costs. You know, the next order of a fleet will just, you know, incorporate the batteries into the, you know, instead of keep retrofitting, we can just- well, Oh actually, yeah, we'll, definitely, definitely. So I think for the Oyster Bay branch, it's to, to, to fully run the existing Oyster Bay branch service, we would have to retrofit 26 train cars to replicate the existing service. So the first decision will be whatever that costs, do we do that first? And then after that, it will be any new cars would just have the batteries built in so they can run anywhere. And then the next frontier is, is going further east, Port Jeff and then, um, you know, Montauk and, 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 and uh, Greenport. Those are longer stretches. So one charging station is not going to cut it. So then it's like how, how many other stations you need along the route, you know, or can you have just small sections of third, of third rail at certain, you know, certain areas so that, that it can get yeah. power as it moves through. So they have to figure that out. The problem with the battery power also is when you discuss a time, if there's a delay or something, you're sucking that battery, you know, faster than usual. So it's it's a very, very fine line to try to figure out battery size, battery power reserve. And weather. Seven. And weather too. And weather, weather too. So that that's yep. that's all the stuff that I have to test in real in in, in the real in the field. This, the... Yeah, because cold weather will take the life right out of those batteries. Mm -hmm. All right. So so basically the bottom line is this is something that's it's probably going to be a couple of years away before we actually see anything in kind of any kind of revenue service or anything like that. It's probably going to take a, a, over a year just to, to get the uh, prototypes going. Exactly. Okay. Hector, is the battery thing used elsewhere on other train systems or no? Not in the U S and in Europe, they, 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 they are using it for light rail. That's how we heard about it, but not, not for like a commuter rail uh, system. So this is totally new. 
it's to totally, everybody. Yeah. Our, our trains are very heavy and they go longer distances. So, but if, if it works, it's, it kind of changes things, right? Yeah, but I have a feeling we're years away from it make working, but, but hey, Mr. The, Mr. Tesla can make batteries for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then, you know, talking about electrifying the rest of the system, that's like tens of billions of dollars that that's not going to happen in our lifetime. Oh, yeah, no, definitely not. not that, that's you're just going to be take our small victories and be happy with them, I guess. It would be nice just to get Oyster Bay going and then if we can get Oyster Bay going, then figure out. You know, if, if Port Jefferson's feasible. Yeah, see, Jerry, um, you have to real, you have to realize also charging time. You can't just plug it in; it's going to be charged in a half an hour. That ain't that's yeah. not going to happen. You know, it could be yeah, hours. So they're going to have to lay up for, like, yeah, you're right. Probably have to lay up for a couple of hours. Oh yeah. Alrighty. Well, you um, did get a question about whether or not flooding is still a big problem on Oyster Bay line, and if that would have an effect on whether or not the emus would be functional, or that would have a problem make it. Um, create a problem with that. Um, Interesting, because yeah. right now in the in the past, uh, uh, the, the the previous two storms, we didn't have, this, we did have a few issues with, with more trees, and the town in um uh, in Locust Valley area, the town had a had a flooding problem, uh, that they had to go over our tracks to kind of get there deal with this. But I don't think we had a, a flooding issue there. But but it is a good point because. Um, with the diesel trains, it doesn't matter because there's no third rail down there. But now we have third rail, you know, if you have a few, you know, a foot of, of water, then that could affect the third rail. Okay. But the Oyster Bay branch, we're not talking about a third rail, we're talking about battery power. Actually, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it really shouldn't be a problem unless it floods right at the charging station, so. But but if we're using the M7s that have the shoes and, and right, so if the water can get into some stuff, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. So I went to the limits of my technical capacity with this conversation. So <laughs> that that's all right. Um, Sorry, Hector. Hector, I, I I should know this, but I'm just just new to the board. Um capital capital improvements is is that through your department, the railroad, or is that all through CMTA uh, construction and development? What I'm, what I'm getting at is now that uh, our governess has uh, killed the Willits Point air train, mm -hmm. one of the things that we want to really push for is to make the Willits Point station accessible. Um, you know, they kept putting it off for years. And then the last time we brought it up, it was, well, it's going to be part of air trains. We don't want to put anything in because we don't know what their design is. But now that that's going away, uh, we want to push to, you know, and have it as an accessible station, especially since it services, you know, City Field, it services the U.S. Tennis Center. Um, who do we, who do, who is the, where should we direct our energies to chase to make this happen? Is it, is it you? <laughs> um, or is it, uh, no, or is so it whoever Janos counter counterpart, who's Janos successor at CND? So, you know, as part of the MTA, this transformation has happened over the last year. Uh, yep. So CND does control the capital projects at all, at all stages. So from, you know, the, the planning part of it, all, all our, Planning people, they they're part of C and D now. The capital okay. project planning. Um, then then when they decide the funding and you know which projects are going to move forward, they kind of have the veto power. And then afterwards, you know how they're going to build them and stuff. So they have they have the say. We're, we're involved, but we don't we don't have the final. You know we we make recommendations of what we think our priorities are and what should proceed. But they kind of have uh, the decision making of, of power. Okay, so I mean that's that's where we'll direct our energies. I mean, obviously we got to go through the board. I know there's no money allocated for it now because they thought the port was port authority was going to pick it up. But uh, so one one thing that I I, uh, I was talking to somebody today about it that, that just to be aware of is that I know we had because I I raised it myself. I knew I, I knew you were going to bring this up. Or well, I I kind of guess you were going to bring it up. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, no, you knew. <laughs> it's okay. So somebody, uh, no, so I asked, I'm like, well, wait a second, you know, we, we had a design for this already to add elevators before the, before the air, air train project. So we did. Uh, so the one question is, 
you know, the that walkway that goes over the tracks from the park department is called the passerelle, you know, that, that, right. that wooden kind of boardwalk. The question is, the city, I think before that whole project, the city was in planning to, to replace that. So now, uh, whatever our design was, was assuming that that was going to stay exactly the way it is. So now we have to go back to the city in a sense and say, you know, when are you changing that? And then are you are you moving it or not? Because then we don't want to build something then all of a sudden they move it, then it doesn't work anymore. Okay. Uh, that so makes that makes sense. I know this isn't going to happen as much as I would like it to. I know it's not going to happen overnight, but at least if we bring it before the board and they can at least set it in motion to start asking the city questions like that, you know, are you are you moving this? Are you replacing this? And then find out if the old design is feasible. And then once we know that, then we can figure out the funding for it. Um, you know, was, that, was Willis Point the best place for this overall? Well, for an elevator. For an elevator? It's not about the well, air no, I'm talking about even for air train. Oh, no, it's on, it's pretty much shot. They say it's on hold under reconsideration, whatever, but it, it's pretty much, it's not going to happen. No. Larry, the answer is no, definitely not. Yeah. That's the short answer. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, because I've actually spoken to her about that. And yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not going to it's done. Um, Hector, is, is would the elevator project um, be transit or LIRR or oh, does it about, not matter I'm anymore? Just, I'm just talking about the railroad because I don't know what the transit. Um, I, I don't think the transit was going to connect with the air train because the air train was going to be at right by our station, I believe, so. But, but the accessibility would be to the seven train also. Would it, the accessibility project would have been to the seven train also. That I don't know, because I, I really wasn't directly involved, but I was only always focused on the railroad part of it, because I, I know that we were, physically we were right right there, so we're, we're gonna be part of it. <laughs> so it sounds, it sounds like C&D is the right place to, yep. maybe CPOC is the place to, dedicate some of those energies at the committee meetings on Monday with some testimony. We have, we have somebody on CPOC. Oh, we testify. We, we, no, we'll no, testify. I mean, but it's like Andrew or Randy, Randy, on, Randy, Randy on CPOC? Yeah. Okay. Not the whisper in his ear Monday morning. All righty. Um, some coffee. He'll, he'll be a happy whisperer. Yeah. Uh, before we let Hector go, does anybody else have any anything for him or... Just put it in the chat box if you oh, Andy. Hi, Hector. So um two things I want to say. Um, number one regarding Elmont. Um is Elmont going to be open before November 20th, or it's just gonna wait until opening night for the islanders? Yes. So it's November 20th, nothing before that. That's the first. That's the first kind of public day that we're going to provide the service. That would logically make sense, yes, because it since both platforms are not going to be available, a lot of my friends who are Islander fans have been asking me, well, what is the option? Do we know it's going to open beforehand or opening night? So at least they got an answer now. And um, second, there's been an issue in Mineola going on around the area of Roslyn Road. Um, a lot of pedestrians and drivers have been complaining about the underpass that apparently there's no lighting over there. So is the MTA responsible for that or is the village of Mineola responsible for that? Roslyn Road or Willis Avenue? Roslyn Road. So there's, there's no lighting there right now. I mean, typically whoever controls a road is usually responsible for lighting. Uh, you know, for to light the roads and the sidewalks, we, we usually don't do that. Oh, so because it's underneath the tunnel. So around the tunnel area, there's not even any lighting in there. I mean, the road is a still a tunnels, A lot of tunnels don't have lights because they're not that they're not kind of long enough. Uh, but all right. So them, what I'll do, them. what I'll do is I'll reach out to Mayor Scott Strauss and see if he has anything to say about this. Okay. Best case scenario. He'll tell you to come back next month and ask Hector. <laughs> you know, it's, if those are county roads, so I believe that's Nassau County uh, Highway Department that's responsible for that. If you know, if they All want right. to install it. Thank you. Right. But uh, Andy, get get back to us. Let us know what you hear. 
Yeah, definitely. I will try to reach out to Mayor Strauss and I'll try to reach out to Nassau County then. Really appreciate it. Um, anybody else have anything for Hector before we cut him loose? Going once, going twice. Hector, thank you so much. We really appreciate thank it. You. All right. No problem. All right, so we go down to old business. Um, I think we have well, nothing to hang your hat on, but we do have some information on wage works. Lisa, mm -hmm. you want to fill us in on that? Yeah, I, so, yes. And interestingly enough, because it was timely, in fact, I got a call today from somebody in Suffolk County, um, a, com a commuter who wanted to know um, what the story was. She'd heard from some of her colleagues that you could just fill in a form and get a wage works um, refund. And I said, no, that's not true, but hopefully one day soon it will be. And I sort of went into the whole saga and then uh, checked back in with our friends in uh, Senator Schumer and Congresswoman Rice's office. And I'm still awaiting word. Um, they had drafted legislation um, and we had sent them back several questions uh, asking for um, to in include people who'd been laid off or, or lost their jobs, if that was possible to um, include them in getting refunds. Um, to see if 2020 needed to be included in the language and to see if the draft legislation uh, required there to be taxes taken out or whether it was, you know, whether there were, whether there was a tax penalty at any yeah. point. Uh, and hadn't heard back from them. You know, I, obviously they're, they're all busy trying to get various pieces of legislation um, passed at this moment um, regarding uh, reconciliation and infrastructure package. So, budget. <laughs> uh, well, the budget, right. So th yeah. that seems to have at least um, we can have a little bit of room in, under the ceiling right yeah. now where we can breathe. Um, and the next up are both the uh, infrastructure BIF and the reconciliation and the uh, wage works legislation, as, as we call it, uh, it, which doesn't have an HR number yet. So we can't even track it um, is part of what the plan was to have it included as part of the reconciliation package. So we're monitoring that as part of the advocacy, the National Advocacy Coalition with which we work. Um, and that's, you know, moving in fits and starts and we'll, we'll keep our fingers on the pulse there. But it's interesting that people, A, uh, are again, you know, wanting to know what's happening with that, even as they're starting to go back to work. She did say that you know, the Long Island Railroad has been good about allowing people to use you know, the money that was in their mail and ride for different ticket types, although she wishes there were another option beside a 10 track, a 10, a 10 trip. And I was like, well, yeah. hopefully soon there will be. Um, <laughs> but also that she knew to call us uh, to ask us that question. So, um, you know, that's that, that's good news. Well, and we'll keep you posted on that. And he, here's a bad part of all that, at least. Um, people are starting to hit that 18 month hurdle. They're actually losing that money. So now the legislation is going to have to include recovery uh, functions because people are now losing. There was an 18 month lag on money that was taken out. If you don't use it, you lose it. We're at that. Eight, we're past the 18 month now. People are literally starting to see their account numbers going down because they're losing the funds. Now, is there going to be a recovery feature on this, too? So that's something that we have to. Right. So that's, in that's, a, that's an interesting point, because my understanding was that if you if your card you know, expired that you could pay to get a new card. That means you had to pay to get a new card. Well, there was the things that like you, when your money was taken out pre-tax, it was 18 months. If you don't use it, it disappears. And we're at that 18 month. Now that people are losing money. And, uh, you know, I've, I've spoken to a bunch of people and I actually, I was in Washington last week and uh, I spoke to some of the people that I know in Schumer's office. And I, you know, said, Hey, look, you know, we've got, this issue being added in, and they didn't even know about this. Okay. Like the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is. And yeah. unfortunately, Schumer being the powerful man that he is, he's great in front of a camera with ideas, but you know, he once he gets out of that camera, he drops the ball on a lot of stuff, unfortunately. And he, he's, he doesn't realize the ramifications now, as time goes on, if this money's gonna get lost, is it gonna be able to be recovered? I don't know the answer um, to that. No, I think that that's important for, uh, you know, your, his staff is running around and is in, a, in a many different oh, ways. Yeah. So that's important for us to let his staff know also. So we will, we'll, I'll, I'll follow up with them and let them know that too. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't believe we had any other old business. 
unless somebody can think of something. So then we'll just move down to new business and mm -hmm. that would be the freedom ticket launch. Uh, Lisa, yeah. you wanna, that was yesterday. That was yesterday. So yesterday after 18 months, uh, two years of blood, sweat and tears on Bradley's part um, of working very hard on putting together the freedom ticket phase two report uh, and recommendations, freedom ticket phase two now more than ever. Uh, which would be an expansion of commuter rail uh, discounts to um, in a in a phased in recommendations for expansion of commuter rail discounts in a two phase um, approach uh, to um, to bring those uh, discounts to more people to get more people on the rails bring more people back on board uh, make make travel more affordable and also bring money into the MTA's pockets. Um, and to use out of borough transit account money to help support that money, uh, th th those those efforts. One of the um, one of the uh, you know real re efforts that we, one of the real causes or one of the real um, purposes behind this is to show that there's sufficient need to run the service at least that's being run now, not not to cut anything, but to in even increase it. Um, you know, as, as we've heard from Hector on a pretty monthly basis, there's more service, if there's a need for more service and they will consider adding cars or trains. Um, and we've seen some of that happen. Um, and, the, and the research that Bradley did showed that there was, uh, that there was by and large an off peak hours, pre-pandemic um, time, there was, uh, capacity and empty seats on most lines for um, for people to uh, uh, to, to for empty seats on on most lines, um, and definitely in the reverse peak um, and in off peak. So the recommendations for for phase one was to um, expand uh, the disc commuter rail discounts. I'm sorry, I'm getting an echo in the back of me, so that's why I'm I'm pausing a little bit because I'm getting bounce. Um, to expand commuter rail discounts to New York City stations on Long Island Railroad and Metro North with, uh, with transit um, transfers to subways and buses. And then to do for the MTA to do an analysis of how that works, what that does to ridership, what that does to their bottom line, and then to look at expanding that in a second phased approach uh, to uh, off peak and reverse peak discounts um, into the into um, further out onto Long Island and into Metro North territory for intra and inter county travel. And we um, had with us Senator Comrie um, from who's been a, I would say, a very large proponent of this, and also Council Member Gudanchik. Um, and the MTA has said that they appreciate the fact that. Uh, you know, that they're looking at different fare policy and they appreciate uh, recommendations that come with funding um, considerations attached to them, which is one of the reasons that we put forward uh, funding uh, opportunity or option as well. Uh, we did have some very good conversations with elected officials. We had some eye-opening conversations with elected officials in advance of this um, that had helped us to tweak our approach particularly with leading into a phased um, uh, uh, implementation. Um, Bradley, do you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, well, basically uh, you left out the improvements to the current Atlantic ticket, which is also in phase one. So we're calling for, because there's been a, a, a lot of input by our own council members and the public that it's very difficult, uh, one, to get the ticket because it's not available on eTix or Omni or anything like that. Um, it's only available at ticket vending machines. Oftentimes they are broken and they don't direct riders to the Atlantic ticket op options in, uh, for eligible stations. And uh, we did source uh, the Long Island Railroad today, which talked about how many um, peak fares were charged, how many people were overcharged for their fares. Um, so we want to make sure that people actually know that it's there and making sure that the ticket vending machines are programmed uh, the correct way so that people aren't overpaying for fares. Um, and I don't wanna 
double talk, Lisa, you covered everything else, but I do want to point out real quick, we have Shell Picker on our uh, meeting today who I want to give credit where credit is due. It definitely took a village and he did a lot of research, especially when it came to the bus connections, the increase in frequency, um, various many other things that I'm, I'm totally leaving out, but he was very instrumental in helping us fine tune the report, find mistakes where there was, you know, typos and links that weren't working and misstatements and stuff like that. So he was extremely helpful in this. So I want to uh, thank you, Shaul, um, and uh, give you credit for all the work that you've done on this. Also, we have our new staff members who have been extremely helpful. We've got Kara Girl, who's our research and communications associate. And she came in right at the right time, especially for the social media push and be able to push all that out. Uh, and get that together, and you will see that you know on our on our Twitter feed and and stuff like that. That what she's done with that is absolutely amazing. Uh, Jessica Spezio has been front and center, helping support us in everything that we do, and we couldn't have done yesterday without her. She's you know she reads the the energy in the room, and she knows when we all need help, and she's been supporting us every step of the way uh, since she's been here, and that's been helpful. And I also want to thank Lisa. She's see me work through this report over the last 18 months. I've actually been working on this for the past six or seven years with the first phase and going back and forth with her with, I don't even know how many versions of the report that we have, um, but with her editing capabilities and being able to like uh, look at things through a different lens and be able to pull out, especially like the funding stuff that we included into the report for her recommendation. So, you know, it's, yeah, I led the report, but really it takes an entire village and everyone here has been extremely helpful in putting that together. And I just want to thank everyone who's participated in this. And um, I just thank you all very much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Jerry, thank you for your leadership on this yes, as well. Thank you. Thank I mean, you. Jerry, Jerry's pointed out that this isn't just about getting writer's discount, it's about getting the MTA money. Right. Um, and I think yeah. Jerry's input about the phased approach was really helpful when we were fine tuning the report, like literally in the last few days putting in that phased in language was very helpful. So thank you for that, Jerry. Well, yeah, I think the concern with the MTA is, is they want to be sure at the very least, this is revenue uh, neutral. Uh, right. They don't want to give away the store and wind up actually losing money on this. Um, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but but right. that's the mindset there is, right. yeah, it all seems very nice for the commuters, but you know, what about us? So. Uh, I think if we take it, if we take it slow, we do it in a phased approach and then, you know, you get phase one in there and it's like, oh, okay, this ain't too bad. Then they'll be a lot more likely to expand it, you know, further. And pretty much that's what we did when we went, we had Atlantic ticket. We had to show that Atlantic ticket worked before we could actually move on to freedom ticket. If Atlantic yeah, ticket was a, was a loser, they would have said, you know, we're drinking our bath water. Don't, don't right. bother us. So. And and that that's very true, Jerry, because like in the very first round of Freedom Ticket, of course, we were uh, looking at everything and they were like, wait, wait, hold on. We got some capacity problems going into Penn Station. So then we started re really looking at the Atlantic branch per having conversations with the railroad. And because there was so much capacity available there, that that was the right starting point to see how it works. Lessons learned before it gets expanded to everything else. But of course, we're at the at the point now where because of the current conditions and everything that it, it should be expanded. So um, small yes, victories. That's very true. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> so we'll, we'll be, that's what we'll be testifying. Um, we're going to take care and throw out in front of the wolves on at the board meeting on Wednesday. <laughs> uh, we'll be testifying uh, about that and also about um, continuing to press on um, accessibility at Metzville at this point. Uh, I did want to um, also note, speaking about small victories, that um, we've some good old fashioned um, advocacy and, and um, behind the scenes work. We were, if you've gone on to eTix lately, you've seen that there's a now a banner that says that off peak fares are in, are, are in effect at all times. Um, and that's something that uh, is something that we've been pushing for for quite some time, um, but it's also, it, it helped that there was a story in LIR today um, that, uh, included what Bradley referenced earlier about what people had overpaid in the last year, but um, that, that we sort of elevated. So um, it, it, you know, I, I think it makes a big difference. And I've seen signs everywhere um, at stations that point that out. So that's a good, a good reminder for people. 
Okay. So, do we do anything else you want to bring up, Lisa? Or and we're hoping that by, by the time we have our next meeting, our new website will be launched. Uh, and at our PCAC meeting, we did promise to send out a link to members for the working um, on, on for the stage the stage site, the staging site. So we will get that out to you in the next few days. So you can take a look at it and let us know your thoughts. And Ron, hopefully, you too. So hopefully on our on our next agenda for new business, you did the freedom ticket launch this month. Hopefully new business will be the website launch <laughs> or website relaunch since it's a new right. website. And anything else, sir? Yeah, Lisa, I have, a, I have a question oh. for Lisa. Lisa, did, did you ever get it around to, and amongst the other 105 thing, things that you're doing, um, about so we can get ID so this way we can get access to the Mineola office? So, right, so the, the, the Mineola office, we now have the lease, um, and we now need to, I need to get the keys for the new um, office and the IDs for there. We just need to let them know when we're gonna be there. So Elisa, Elisa Pika, who's the person who I communicate with, I communicate um, more, say that. Um, so it's not always, um, I need to probably communicate with the uh, Deputy General Counsel who I was, I had for been in touch with. For what it's worth, I've got a key. It's a different office. No, a different office. <laughs> oh, they moved us. <laughs> Yeah. They moved us. Oh, what happened to all the stuff that we had in there? Did they move all that stuff too? We, I don't think we really no, had anything in no, there. No, that stuff. No, that stuff was all kind of staged for the the opening of the office. That was stuff that we brought in from our office here, and we ended up packing it all up and taking it back. They just in that office, the facilities provided the desk and stuff like that, but there was nothing that was functioning in the office, so we just took all. Yeah, the there stuff was back a bunch off. of because I remember I bought a bunch of frames and put a bunch of plaques or whatever i forgot you know awards or whatever the hell it was because so i did a bunch of those yeah um all right so well yeah all right i guess i'll make a contact to you and tell you when i can potentially get a key or whatever i get yeah give us some um notice on that i when you want to go there because I, I would like to go there too and i would like to sit down with them and find out when they're going to give us some names for um their vacancies you know what though i didn't want to push that issue with the vacancies only because with the new governor coming in, I'm sure she had a lot of things further up the list, but uh, I, I'm sure in the next month or so, that's something that we'd want to, you know, talk to them about. You're nicer than I am because I've already pushed it. Um, and <laughs> we, um, uh, well, we I think she's thinking a little more like the board level right now where, you know, a certain individuals on his way out. <laughs> yeah. She is, but yeah. we, um, we had had a conversation with her, Deputy Secretary for Transportation, who was who was newly uh, appointed a month or so ago, and I had a follow up um, email exchange with that person and told her one of our major issues was the length of time to get somebody to be appointed, um, and about that it's been years in some cases, um, and she was pretty horrified to hear that. Um, not long after that, a new uh, appointments secretary was appointed themselves, herself. Um, and now there's a deputy, a, a deputy um, intergovernmental, a deputy secretary for intergovernmental, who actually reached out and called me the day that the governor made the announcement about the air train um, uh, uh, decision. And it, I, I almost fell over because I don't recall that happening before. Um, and it's somebody who had run for a city council in the district in which I live. So we had a lovely chat. Um, but it's, uh, you know, making those inroads is very helpful. And I'm going to re reach out to them again. Yeah. And the one, thing another is one with, for the small victories column. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, with her people, I'm going to be nice. I'm calling a lot of them civilians. They are very inexperienced, a lot of her staff. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to be nice. The very no, no, we understand. We we understand what you're saying. It's it, they're, you know, they're newbies. They're coming in from the outside. You know? Yeah, sure. And a lot of it is like my friend's sister's cousin. It's that kind of stuff. People that are in the administration right now. That's the only people she can trust. Well, gotta, I, so, I, so, there's a, let's just say there's a learning curve. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there is. The, it definitely is yeah. a learning curve. Oh no, the, the stuff that I've got to deal with on a regular basis with those people is. 
amazing. It really is. It's like a lot of, excuse me, what, what, what did you just ask? You know, that kind of thing. Um, oh. Well, then, well, thank you for helping to school them. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> I know, I'm we, being nice. We want, Larry to still have a, we want Larry to still have a job tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All righty, so is everybody good? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. We have a second. Jerry, I second. Yeah. We're good. Okay. okay. All right, there we go. Thank you, everybody. Greatly appreciated. And uh, a judge dismissed a lawsuit Wednesday by Donald Trump. Take care, guys. Bye. All right, how we go, Ron? <laughs> now I can actually leisurely, leisurely get the Penn Station for my 551. You were unable to find any counterfeit ballots.